All right, good morning, good morning. Well, uh, the message this morning, I've entitled it 10 Points for Christians. And we're going to be in 1 John. And 1 John, it was a time when there were people in the church where he was pastoring that um, had different ideas of what Christianity was, and they were trying to get others to come alongside with their beliefs. And the apostle John, he designed these questions, if you will, and we'll look at them this morning to kind of help us determine if we are true followers of Christ, and if we live in a way that reflects the Word of God in our lives. I'll start off by saying that I myself had personal challenges as I examined myself through the lens of these following ten passages of scriptures. But however, I want you to keep in mind that it isn't about passing some sort of a test or um, how many you get right or how many you get wrong, but it's about your reaction to the results. A true follower of Christ will be heartbroken and humbled when they honestly examine themselves and truthfully and answer each one of these questions. Now, a person who isn't a follower of Christ will not be concerned with the results. You know that we hear all the time that only God knows the heart of a person. Although that is true, it isn't always true. The heart of a person is known by that person. You know what's going on in your heart. You know the condition of your heart. And you know the condition of your faith in Jesus Christ. So in the light of Scripture, I encourage you this morning to examine yourself this challenged me in my walk with Christ, and I hope and I pray that this challenges you and maybe perhaps even those might realize that they are not living as true followers of Jesus Christ should. So we'll begin. We'll call this number one. Do you enjoy fellowship with other Christians? 1 John 1, 6 through 7. 1 John 1, 6 through 7. If we say that we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and we do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light... As he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. So do you enjoy being around other believers? Do you enjoy and look forward to attending church and discuss discussing scriptures with others uh, Bible studies, or do you avoid church, thinking that religion should be avoided in all conversations in your life, or it's better to hang out with unbelievers? So this verse says that those who claim Christ but show no signs of change in their life, well, they're lying. This is 
a typical interpretation as a reference to false converts and or those who do not, in fact, have saving faith in Jesus Christ. So it's important to note that the Bible never commissions Christians as some sort of salvation police. It doesn't do that. And, or does it encourage judgment of other people's salvation? The Bible tells us that you will know them by their fruit. You will see fruit in their life. But nowhere does it tell us that we have the right to judge a person whether or not they are truly saved. Those who show no change in life may give little evidence that they are believers. But this is ultimately something that only God can truly know. Only God can truly know this. So we go on to number two. Do you believe that you are free of sin? 1 John 1 8. Well, John says, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. So you do you believe in the total depravity of the human heart and acknowledge that you are a sinner and that you are in need of a Savior? Or do you think that you are a good person and that Jesus just makes life better? Just makes life better, so perhaps you can live your best life now. Jesus teaches that those who claim to be without sin do not have the truth in them. This lack of truth applies to the saved believer who claims to have been freed from all sin in their present life. A believer should recognize that his or her sinfulness and need of forgiveness can come only through Christ and through Christ alone. There's nothing that we can do to earn it. No works. doesn't matter how hard you work in life. It's all about Christ and his forgiveness and the price that he paid on the cross for our sins. So we'll look at number three this morning. And the question would be, do you honor God's word and do you keep his commandments? Do you honor God's word and do you keep his commandments? First John chapter two, verses three through four. And John tells us that and by this we know that we have come to know him. This we will know this will be evidence that you know Christ in your life. If you keep his commandments, whoever says that I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. Truth is not in him. Do you seek to understand God's word? Do you seek to obey all of God's commandments? Or are you not concerned with obedience or kind of offer a half partial type of obedience to the commandments? You want to only follow that work for you somehow in your life. I want to do this. I will follow you here, Lord. But over here, yeah, doesn't really work for me doesn't really work for me in my life and the way that I choose to live it. And by this we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. But whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments, John tells us is a liar. And the truth of Jesus Christ is not in him. It's not in him. So number four, the question is, do you love God more than you love the world and the things of the world? 
Do you love God more than the world? Do you love him more than the things of this world? 1 John 2.15. He says, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Do you seek first the kingdom of God? And desire the things that God desires? Or do you seek to fulfill the desires of your flesh? Do you seek to pursue your lusts and take pride in yourself? The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. John emphasizes this theme by saying that those who love the world cannot really love God. These are some strong words. These strong words highlight a contrast between the love of the world and the love of the Father. Jesus Christ himself offered an example to this contrast. When he was tempted by Satan in the wilderness, Jesus Satan first told Jesus he could rule all the kingdoms of the world. I'll give you all this, Jesus, if you would just bow down to me. All of this would be yours, Jesus. If you love, just love the world. Don't love the Father. Love the world. But what did Jesus say? Jesus replied, be gone, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God. And only him shall you serve. You cannot love the world and love God at the same time. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. You just won't do it. You won't love the world more than you love Jesus. You just won't. The fifth question do you deny who Jesus is? 1 John 2.23 No one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever confesses the Son has the Father also. You don't get the Father without the Son, and you don't get the Son without the Father. Do you acknowledge the Trinity? the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Christ's deity and his lordship? Or do you believe Jesus is a good teacher? Some believe that he's an angel. Some believe he's a spiritual child of God or anything else other than God. Those who deny the Father and the Son, specifically those who reject Jesus, are Rejecting God as well. You see, a true believer, a true believer will accept both God the Father and Jesus the Son. John specifically notes this by confirming that those who accept Christ have accepted God the Father. No one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever confesses the Son has the Father also. So number six, do you look forward to his return? This is huge. This is huge. The original church, they longed for the return of Christ. It was part of everything that they were. They revolved their entire life around Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. 1 John 3, 2 through 3. Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him. We shall see him as he is. And everyone 
who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. Is your hope truly based on his return and the redemption of all creation? Are you eagerly waiting for your precious Lord? Are you eagerly waiting for your precious Savior to rescue you into his loving arms? Or are you concerned with the prospect? Eh, he's coming. He's coming soon. You know, we're not really concerned with the condition of our faith at this time or not really concerned about my sin. And, you know, you're not concerned with the salvation of your neighbors. You're not concerned with the condition of your prayer life. You're not concerned with the, you're, you're really not concerned with, with your relationships with, with your brothers and your sisters. And you're not really concerned with your relationship with Jesus at all. Or our future has not yet completely been revealed. In eternity with the Lord, believers will experience a new body. And we will exist forever in the presence of God. In a way that's far superior than anything in our lives today. Some of this is, of, is simply impossible for us to understand and to grasp certain things about Christ and, and the scheme of this whole thing can only be revealed to us once Jesus Christ appears and brings us home and brings us home. Beloved, we are God's children now and what we will be has not yet appeared but we know that when he appears we will be like him we will be like him so the true christian the true child of god longs for the coming of jesus christ and we live our life in a way that reflects that that reflects that so number seven do you practice unrepented sin? 1 John 3, 8. Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil. For the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. To destroy him, you see. So whoever makes a practice of continuous sinning is of the devil, he says. For the devil has been sinning from the beginning. And this is the reason that the Son of God appeared. To destroy, defeat death, and defeat sin, and defeat the works of the devil. So when you sin, do you repent and then get back up and walk in his light? Or do you intentionally continue to sin, somehow seek to justify that sin, or ignore or try to somehow interpret the scriptures somehow? Well, let's see, I'll kind of interpret this to kind of fulfill the desires and, and, and kind of what I'm doing, or, or you just don't have any desire to repent of your sin at all, and you hold on to it. And you continue over and over and over and over again. Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil, for the devil's been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. Now, number eight, do you love your brothers and sisters in Christ? Do you love? your brothers, and your sisters in Christ. 1 John 3, 14. We know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brothers. Whoever does not love abides 
in death? Do you love your church? Do you give to the church financially and sacrificially in service? Do you love others in ministry and you pray for them on a regular basis? Do you always try to focus on laying down your life? Do you always try to focus on um, laying it down for your brothers and sisters? Or do you grumble about your pastor? Do you grumble about your church? Do you gossip about others? Do you withhold your tithe? John is adding here a, here a, a key line of evidence that a person has moved from the realm of evil into the realm of God. There should be a change in your life. There should be a change in who you are. Love. John and his readers loved one another. They loved one another. This Greek root word translate here as love is agape love. This is an agape love. The term implies a selfless love, a self-sacrificing love that is highly and totally focused on other people, thinking better and greater of others than you do yourself. Those who exhibit this kind of love give strong evidence to support that they are true believers in Christ. This is evidence of your salvation in Christ that you love, that you love unconditionally. Number nine, do you listen to the teaching and wisdom of your pastors and your church leaders? 1 John 4, 6, we are from God. Whoever knows God listens to us. Whoever is not from God does not listen to us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. So the question, do you have a hunger for God's word? Do you have this hunger where you listen intentively to sermons? Do you attend and participate in discussions during your Bible studies? Do you seek wisdom? Do you seek instruction from ministry leaders, elders, others? Or do you rarely open your Bible? Do you critique the pastor's sermons? Do you sleep in church? Do you miss Sunday school? Do you ignore the advice of wisdom and, and biblical and godly loving correction from your brothers and sisters in your life? Because we are from God. And whoever knows God listens to us. Whoever is not from God does not listen. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. And number 10. Number 10. Do you confess Jesus? 1 John 4.15 Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God God abides in him, and he in God. So do you witness to those who don't know Christ? Do you share your testimony of what God has done in your life? Or do you share your testimony of what God is doing in your life? And does everyone around you know without a doubt? Does every single person in your life, know without a doubt that you are a follower of Jesus Christ? Or do you never mention Jesus to anyone? Have you no testimony as to how he is impacting your life? Nor do the people in your life know that somehow you're not a Christian. So my question is, were you challenged by any of these scriptures this morning? I know I was. I am. You know, 
We really, really, really need to examine ourselves. This was a purpose in a time. This was in the church. There were people who weren't Christians. There were people who were, weren't quite living the way they were supposed to be living. And John's like, hey, look, here it is. It's, it's, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. It's in black and white. This is it. So this morning, this last question, it is time to ask the gospel question. Have you believed and trusted in Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior of your life? Amen. Amen. And that's it. That's the evidence of your salvation. There are ways that we all need to look at ourselves, and the Bible tells us to examine ourselves and to see if we are living the way that God, and in his commandments, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Those who do not keep his commandments, well, John's pretty clear on the opposite of what that is. But the Bible tells us that we have all sinned and and deserve God's judgment. All of us, all of us do. But God the Father sent his son to satisfy the judgment for those who believe in him. Believe in him and repent of your sins and trust in him as your Lord and your Savior. Jesus is the creator. He is the eternal son of God who lived a sinless life. He loves us so much that he died for our sins, taking the punishment, taking God's wrath upon himself, what we deserved. God commended his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died. Christ died. Then he was buried. The grave could not hold him. In three days he rose from the dead. Rose from the dead. Amen. And according to the Bible, you see, if you truly believe, truly believe and trust him in your heart, receiving Jesus alone as your Savior, declaring Jesus is my Lord. The Bible says you will be saved from the judgment and the wrath of the Almighty God by openly declaring that Jesus is Lord and believing in your heart that God has raised him from the dead. You'll be saved. You will be a Christian. There'll be no doubt in your mind or in your heart that you are a child of God. For it is by believing in this heart that you are made right with God. And it is by openly declaring your faith to the world that you are saved and that you are born again. Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Brothers and sisters, it was a rescue. Jesus came and rescued us from death, from death. And he is coming for us again to save us from this corruption and this world that we are living in that is slowly and even more, more rapidly, morally decaying all around us. But be strong and stand firm because Christ is coming. Jesus Christ is coming. And that is our hope. That is salvation. Our hope in him, our hope in Jesus Christ. It is the hope of glory in our eternal life.